I had an amazing time with Rebirth. It was a well executed progression of what Remake started, and a smart reworking of the section of the original Final Fantasy VII it's adapting. But while the gameplay, the presentation, and the music all hit for me, the biggest disconnect was with the overarching narrative. And this makes sense, it's the middle part of a trilogy, so the story isn't given an easy start or end point, and while there were engaging sub-narratives which did loosely tie together, the narrative did end up feeling more episodic. I think Rebirth's developers were aware of this lack of a strong overarching story, so instead shifted the focus onto characters, making Rebirth far more centred on developing our core cast. This works perfectly with the game structure, and it meant that throughout the game I got more and more attached to the characters that I was following. But, in spite of how much I liked the party members and their character arcs, the character that I enjoyed the most was Rosh. As a new addition introduced in Remake, I enjoyed Rosh's short appearance massively as a highlight of the early game, and as a fun short cameo in Integrade 2. I was a bit worried he wouldn't be included in Rebirth, but this is where he actually gets the most screen time. In spite of this, Rosh only has about an hour to show off in Remake, Integrade, and Rebirth combined, so how did he make such a strong impression? So, a quick reminder for just how little time we actually get with Rosh. In Chapter 4 of Remake, Cloud is riding with Jesse, Biggs and Wedge to Sector 7 topside, and when their fake IDs don't pass the security check, they get chased down by Shinra forces. After they beat down the small fries, we're introduced to Rosh, who after a very dramatic entrance has a race slash fight to his Cloud, which of course, for the sake of story progression, Cloud wins after he manages to damage Rosh's bike, but not without Rosh requesting a rematch when they meet again and we don't have to wait too long for that either. Later in the chapter, while fighting off enemies in the Sector 76 Annex to distract the Shinra guards from Jesse stealing supplies, Rosh returns, and challenges Cloud to a duel, this time off their bikes. This is won again by Cloud, who is still less surrounded by other soldiers, ready to take advantage of his weakened state after the boss. But in a show of questionable loyalties, Rosh fins out their forces and tells Cloud to stay alive for their next dance, leaving our protagonist confused and seemingly a little frustrated. Rosh's cameo in Integrate is fleeting, with him having a little dialogue before and after Yuffie challenges him to Fort Condor. We find him in the Sector 7 slums, where he has clearly been unable to get Cloud off his mind, since he's looking for his so-called dear friend. The only other thing we can glean from this is looking for Cloud is apparently personal business, with him being off the clock and admitting to ignoring Yuffie's Wutaian appearance. We don't get to see him again until Chapter 4 of Rebirth, where he shows up to bother the main party outside the inn in Under Junon. With his signature flair, he announces that he's been ordered to collect Aerith, but in what seems to be a typical dismissal of his orders, tells Cloud that he's really just there to challenge him to a duel when he makes his way to Upper Junon. Later, we witness him take part in Rufus's parade, performing as part of the mobile unit, where he then goes on to accept the award for outstanding performance in perhaps his best moment. He doesn't really get involved with all the chaos following Yuffie's failed assassination attempt until after Cloud has escorted the 7th unit, where he shows up as a final boss of Chapter 4. We fight him in an arena surrounded by his cheering colleagues as he taunts Cloud before their bout. In my favourite battle with Rosh, we get a combination of fighting him on bike and on foot with a challenging moveset and outstanding soundtrack from the marching band. Ever the chivalrous opponent, Rosh accepts his inevitable defeat easily, then commends Cloud for his skill as a fighter and a leader, gifts him a personalised keychain, blows him a kiss and lets him escape Junon without any further trouble, with complete disregard for his original mission to retrieve Aerith. In a drastic tone shift, later on at the end of chapter 9, we see Hojo with Rosh strapped up in his lab, a seemingly willing but apprehensive test subject, with Hojo using what looks to be an extract from Genova. This is left up in the air until the finale of chapter 11, where after leaving the lab manor in Nibelheim, the party run into a group of black robes looking upwards to a helicarrier. Rosh drops down riding his freshly repaired bike and calling after Cloud, then following a little performance, proceeds to destroy it once again. He is noticeably more dishevelled, hair messier with grey streaks, and his uniform torn too. A startled Cloud momentarily mistakes him for Sephiroth, likely because of the Genova extract, and Aerith tells him that she's not going to be taken by him, which Rosh quickly denounces, saying he is, in typical fashion, denying orders and just there to satiate his hunger to beat Cloud and challenge him once again. Seemingly self-aware of his fate, he calls the battle his final lap and starts his third and of course last one-on-one -on -one with Cloud. With a completely new moveset, using abilities similar to Sephiroth, it still isn't enough to beat Cloud, and after this he's completely exhausted. 
He tells Cloud there is no escaping the degradation, and as an immediate example of this, he is surrounded by the black robes and rises as one of them, a shell of himself wandering away with the crowd. We don't see him again until chapter 13, where he isn't even called Rosh anymore, just Robed Man, falling into Cloud and pointing him towards Sephiroth and the Black Materia. In my original playthrough, I thought this was the last we see of him, and I assumed he died in the Setra Temple, but it turns out there's a quick moment where we see him strapped into the back of Hojo and Rufus's helicopter, writhing and bleeding from the mouth as Sephiroth confronts the party below. And then soon after, in a foreboding moment right at the start of chapter 14, we see Rufus deny Hojo the opportunity to experiment on Sung, motioning to Rosh saying he has enough material already. So, while Rosh might still have some life left in him, it's fair to say that the Rosh we met in Remake at least is dead, or at least a shell of his former self. So why does this relatively minor, relatively tragic character resonate with me so much while playing through Rebirth especially? Rosh gives the plot of Rebirth stakes. Like I mentioned, the overarching narrative of Rebirth is relatively weak. The main party spends most of the adventure following the black robes around the map and getting caught up in misadventures along the way. We know that these black robes are former soldiers like Cloud who have fallen into this zombie-like state following the degradation caused by the genetic mutation involved in becoming a soldier for Shinra. The possibility of Cloud undergoing this degradation looms over him in Rebirth, but it never feels like something which will actually happen. The black robes are pretty dehumanized throughout the campaign. There's a side quest chain where we push them in the right direction because they're barely in control of themselves, and when we see them die or mutate, it's never really given any gravity because they're seen as barely alive and just shells of bodies that used to be people. People that we never knew. But when we see Rosh transform, it's given that attention. Sure, he hasn't had the same amount of time dedicated to him as Cloud has, but he's been a recurring and strongly characterized figure in the plot. It would be difficult to argue that Rosh doesn't have much personality. He's brash and unhinged, energetic and flamboyant, and from what I've seen, this has made him relatively divisive, with some people finding him annoying. But the general consensus, at least from my perspective, is that fans of the games mostly like him. The more you think about Rosh, the more interesting he is. He's a third class soldier, but is clearly capable of getting a promotion skills wise, but is held back by his rebellious nature. This rebellion against Shinra makes him feel less like a villain and more like an anti-hero, but not the typical edgy anti-hero. He's driven by his ambition and that's why he's become so enamoured by Cloud, chasing him around the map. This ambition often manifests in narcissism, with his self-obsession obvious and his lack of concern for his colleague's safety clearly exemplified multiple times. But at the same time, he's clearly popular within his ranks and he's perhaps the most chivalrous adversary Cloud faces, with his battles being one-on-one -on -one duels, him admitting defeat fairly, and the genuine praise and souvenirs he hands out to those he deems worthy. But all the while, and in spite of his unconventional personality, in the grand scheme of Final Fantasy VII, he's a pretty normal guy. He isn't a chosen one, he doesn't impact the world's fate, he's just a third class soldier that happens to get more screen time than the hundreds of others that share his rank. We don't know anything of his backstory, but from what we understand based on his personality, we can see why he's the type of person to become a soldier, and why he'd let Hojo experiment on him to become stronger. So, when we watch a character so full of life essentially have his personality drained from him to join the mindless group of zombies we've been literally pushing around for the past 50 hours, it's a gut punch that drives the threat of degradation home. Rosh's arc in Rebirth is undeniably tragic, but this makes the overall plot feel more impactful thanks to his contribution. But as sad as it feels if you're a fan of his character, if your world has characters not always getting their way and things going wrong, it will make your world feel real. And in this case, it also solidifies Shinra's villainy. Jenny Lader put it well saying, it's one of those moments where it feels like we really see everything pay off. Rosh goes from this supplemental character for some silly encounters and boss fights to becoming a perfect example of what Shinra is capable of. While I still think the overall narrative of Rebirth felt a little lacking, with Rosh, the developers take advantage of their strong character writing to give the narrative a real sense of threat. Rosh's worth isn't all in his symbolic death, of course, with every scene he's in being better because of his presence, and that can be attributed to his writers, the impressive work of his voice actors, as well as how he's animated, especially in Rebirth. The reason why he's my favourite character in Rebirth is that he has the advantage of a completed arc. While I enjoy all the main party members, their arcs are still being drawn over a trilogy of games, but since Rosh is more short-lived, he's already had a satisfying payoff, and of course, personal bias as well. 
I say this with a grain of salt since it's hinted in Rush's last couple of appearances that there is more to come with him being retrieved by Hojo and Rufus, but we'll have to wait until about 2028 to find out where that goes. If you have any theories, let me know. Rebirth put a lot of stock into developing the characters it presented us with, and while I look forward to how the core party are going to develop in the third entry, I can confidently say that Rosh was my highlight so far. One, two, three! Thanks for listening to me talk about one of my favourite semi-obscure characters for a while. I wanted to keep it short, but if you have any thoughts about Rosh or think there's anything I missed out, make sure to let me know. If you like what you saw, make sure to subscribe since I got some more Final Fantasy videos planned for the next couple of months and some longer videos too. And on the topic of subscribers, thank you so much for 1000. Whether you've been subscribed since two years ago or two hours ago, thanks for being interested in what I'm putting out. And a more specific thank you to Annie for helping me edit the script for this and most of my other videos too it helps immeasurably. But before I finish, some miscellaneous Rosh notes which I couldn't find anywhere to talk about in the video. I referenced it a little bit, but I can't work out how much people actually like Rosh. Obviously I did some research, and there seem to be people who like him as much as I do, but there isn't a load of fan art or discussion around him, so I can't really grasp the scale on which people like his character. He got a really high quality figure made, but I don't really know if there's a demand for it. But if you're a fan of Rosh, let me know. I want to know how many Rosh enjoys there are. Also, while I was writing this, I found the Tumblr page of Rosh's English voice actor who made a post which seems to contribute to the ship of Rosh and Cloud, which I find quite funny. But Rosh is in a glass closet, so honestly that's not really any secret, but I just thought it was funny to see the voice actor posting about it. As you can imagine, I couldn't find any natural way to include that in the main video, but I just thought it was worth mentioning. But this is the actual end now, so thanks for watching!